God bless you. My name is Pastor Harris Kakalides, and you're watching and hearing the program, Getting to Know Jesus. And today we're going to talk about Revelation chapter 10. We're going to read the first verse. And I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head. And his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. This mighty angel is either Christ or, uh, or someone that represents him. Though Jesus is God, yet in the Old Testament, he has revealed himself as the angel of Jehovah. When people came in contact with that angel, they realized it was God who they were speaking to. You can see this in Genesis 16, verses 7 to 13. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring of the way of Shar. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from? And where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man, his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord, who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? Notice, she called the angel of the Lord, the angel of Jehovah, she called him, Lord, she called him Jehovah. This is important to note that the angel in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament was Jehovah himself, was Jesus Christ. We can see this in Exodus 3, verses 1 to 4. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord, or Jehovah, appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. Where, where was God? God called him in the midst of a bush. Where was the angel of the Lord? He was in the midst of the bush. It was the angel of the Lord was Jehovah himself. So you can also see in this in Judges chapter 13 verses 15 to 23 when it speaks about Manorah um, and his wife seeing the angel of the Lord and saying, uh, we saw God but our life was spared from us. The angel means messenger, and many times God the Son himself was his own messenger. He's clothed with a, with a cloud, and his feet like pillars of fire. When God led Israel through the wilderness, he guided them through a pillar of fire by night and a pillar cloud by day. Exodus 13, verse 21, 22. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the, the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And the scripture teaches us that Jesus went to heaven up in a cloud, Acts 1 verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And then we see him going to the Father to receive power and authority in a cloud in Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14. And I saw watching in the night 
vision and behold one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven and he came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him then he and then to him was given dominion glory and a kingdom that all people nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion we shall not we shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed and then we see a rainbow on his head this same rainbow is the one on the Father's head as well. And he who sat there was like a jasper, and he saw the stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in the appearance like an emerald. We describe it as a rainbow which reminds God not to destroy the world again through water. And we can see this in Genesis 9 verses 11 to 17, which we're not going to read it. Because there's so much to speak about. But God will destroy the the world again, but it will be by fire. Second Peter chapter three verses ten to twelve. As we continue speaking, the angel's face, which I believe to be Jesus, or a representative of Jesus, the angel's face was like the sun. A picture of the Mount of Transfiguration where the disciples saw a glimpse of Jesus in all his glory. Jesus' face was as the sun in brightness, Matthew 17, verse 2. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, when Jesus appears to John, we see Jesus as the sun in full strength. Revelation 1 16 and he had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. Jesus appeared to Paul with a light brighter than the sun. Acts 26 verse 13 at midnight day O king along the road I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journey with me side note the Christians are promised that they will shine as the sun at Jesus coming Matthew 13 verse 43 then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father he who has an ear let him hear but I want you to notice in this verse it is filled with so much description and all these descriptions describe Jesus Christ Revelation 10 verses 1 and I saw a mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was on his head his face was like the Sun and his feet like pillars of fire all these things describe Jesus so it probably is Jesus Christ if it's not Jesus it's someone who represents Jesus in verse 2, we see in Revelation 10, verse 2, it says, And he had a little book on his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. A little book, a better translation, a little scroll. Um, the expository notes of Dr. Thomas L. Constable states the following about this scroll. The little scroll in his hand may be different from the scroll of Jesus Christ and row in Revelation 5 verse 1 and Revelation 6 verse 1. John used a different and rare Greek word to describe it. Biberidian, not Bibion. The tense of the Greek verb translated was open. Perfect passive indicates that someone had opened it and it was then open in his hand. It probably represents a new revelation from God. So this is what Thomas Constable believes because of the way the the, the word, um, the scroll is described, is described as a scroll that was already open. Um, it probably was the same scroll, but this time the scroll has been opened. So it, it used the word as the scroll was already open. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. This means that he had authority over the sea and the land. Deuteronomy 11.24 Every place on which the sole of your foot trends shall be yours. From the wilderness and Le Lebanon. From the river 
Euphrates, even till Western Sea shall be your territory. So when a person pets their feet in those directions, it means authority, at least in the scripture wise. That's why when they conquer the kingdom, um, usually the king will put his feet on the neck on the, uh, of the other king that was conquered. Uh, it means authority. Let's go to verse 3. Revelation 10 verse 3 and and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars when he cried out seven thunders alter their voices if this angel is Christ Jesus here we see him as the lion of Judah roaring but we also see here as we see in Revelation 8 verse 5 then the angel took the censer filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth and there were noises thunders lightnings and an earthquake whether it's jesus or not we see the things that are done by these angels affect the sky so great thundering comes about it but in this case we see that the thunders have something to say it's funny how the cults and false religions always have something to state about what the seven thunders stated like they know but in reality they do not know nothing and many gullible people follow them but these words are a mystery which will not be revealed till the end of the tribulation so this is a secret no one if someone tells you now i know what the seven thunders said well count that person as a false prophet or a false teacher because no one really knows it. And it's funny how all these false religions, Seven Day Adventists, Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, they all state that they know what the seven thunders had to say. And they don't. Revelation 10, verse 4 says Now, when the seven thunders all to their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, See you up the things which the seven thunders alter, and do not write them. <clears throat> God said, To seal it up. Make it a secret, make it a mystery. John was told not to write it down. What the seven thunders had to say. This is a mystery that in its time shall be fulfilled. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. That we may do all the words of this law. We have to be content with what he has showed us. And wait for that time when in his own time will show us what these seven thunders stated now let's read verses five through seven the angel whom i saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and soared by him who lives forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are in it the earth and the things that are in it and the sea and the things that are in it that there should be delay no longer, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God will be finished, as declared to his servants, the prophets. The, mis the word mystery is used in the scripture 22 times in the New King James. There will be a time when all mysteries of God will be revealed. This will include some of the following, though some of these are already revealed to us in Scripture and is not so much a mystery when it is revealed in the Scripture plainly to the believer, but it remains a mystery to those who don't serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And the things which are a mystery to us in time, God will show us, especially when the, the last trumpet is sounded. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. But now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know just as I also am known. Number one, let's look the mystery of the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 4, verse 11. And he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables. Number two, the mystery of the spiritual blindness of Israel for a time. Romans 11, verses 25. For I do not 
desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, thus you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness and poor has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Number three, the mystery of the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Number four, the mystery of God's will. Ephesians 1, verse 9. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in himself. Number five, the mystery of godliness, how God came as a man and lived among us. First Timothy 3, verse 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. That is a great mystery, how God was able to continue being God and becoming man. I know that Jesus is God, and he is also man. That, that is a mystery. Uh, even if you believe in the Trinity, it's still a mystery how Jesus could be in heaven and be on earth at the same time. And I'm not talking being in heaven because of the Father's in heaven or being in heaven because the Holy Spirit is in heaven. John chapter 3, verse 13 says, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. What? That's what John 3 verse 13 states. Some translations don't say it because they don't they don't want to deal with this topic. But Jesus was on earth and he was in his body, but Jesus was also in heaven there as well. That's a mystery. Well, how God, the second person of the Trinity, could be in earth. And in heaven at the same time. That is a great mystery. The mystery of the woman and the beast. In Revelation 17 verse 7 is number 6. But the angel said to me. Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman. And of the beast that carries her. Which has the seven heads and the ten horns. There's more mysteries in the Bible. I just shows six. <clears throat> six of them. Because those, those six I... I chose because I, I thought these were more to my focus on. Well, there's more mysteries in the scriptures. But now, let's go to verse 8 of Revelation 10, verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open, the little scroll which is open in, your, in the hand of the angel, who stands on the sea and on the earth. Twice John is told to take in chapter 10 of Revelation. Once in verse 8 was by the, from the voice from heaven. And in verse 10 by the angel. The human will is resistant to doing God's will. This is why the voice from heaven and, and, um, <clears throat> and the angel had to tell John uh, to take. Man is resistant. Man don't easily follow God. Uh, man is stubborn. Even when he's alive spiritually, he's still stubborn due to his flesh. Chapter 10 of Revelation, verses 9 and 10. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter. But it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it and it was sweet as honey in my mouth but when I had eaten it my stomach became bitter this very experience was given to a prophet Ezekiel Ezekiel chapter 2 verses 8 and Ezekiel 3 verses 1 to 3 but you son of man hear what I say to you do not be rebellious like the rebellious house Open your mouth and eat what I will give you. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat the scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I will give you. So I ate and it was in my mouth like honey 
in sweetness. Jeremiah, Jeremiah spoke about eating God's word and finding it sweet. Jeremiah 15 verse 16. Your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. Job spoke about the word of God as the following. In Job 23 verse 12. I have not departed from the commandments of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. David stated about God's word in the following. Psalms 19 verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold, yeah, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. But why is it bitter to the stomach? I did a little study on bitterness, and this is what I found. When Esau found out that he lost the blessing to his brother, he cried in bitterness. Genesis 27, verse 34. Egypt made the life of Israelites bitter with hard bondage. Exodus 1, verse 14. The Israelites were to eat their Passover with bitter herbs. Exodus 12, verse 8, which they was to keep in this manner, Numbers 9, verse 11. In the wandering in the desert, they would they could not drink the waters from Marah, for it was bitter. And God told Moses to cast a tree to the water, and the water was made sweet, Exodus 15. Numbers 5, verses 14 to 31, where we see a jealous husband taking his wife to the priest to examine her before God if she had has been unfaithful and she receives a drink of bitter water which has a curse on it for the woman if she has been unfaithful. When Mordecai found out that about Haman planned to destroy the Jews, he cried in bitterness, Esther 4 verse 1. Husbands are told not to be bitter to their wives, Colossians 3 verse 19. James, when speaking about the tongue, states out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things are not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive, olives or grapevine, bear figs? Thus no springs yields both salt water and fresh. There are more verses which we could look at, but... What does bitterness in the stomach means, and why John? John was pronouncing God's judgment. God's words are, are sweet, but his judgment was not, but bitter to them who was to receive them. The stomach or bowels is seen in scripture many times in reference to feelings, the deaths of the feelings of the believer. Philippians 1 verse 8, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. That's Philippians 1 verse 8. Colossians 3 verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy, beloved, and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and suffering. First John three seventeen. But whosoever hath the world's good, and see if his brother's brother have need, and shut him up his bowels of compassion from him, how doth dwelleth the love of God in him. So John was very pleased because the very sweetness of God's word. He was also very grieved because of his judgments. Not happy because he was an instrument of God, but not so happy because of the judgment which God told him to pronounce. This is why Jeremiah in his book will state God's words is wonderful, but he will also state the following, Jeremiah 23, verse 9. My heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake, and I am like a drunken man, and like a man whom wine has overcome because of the Lord and because of his holy words. Lamentation 3, verse 15 states, He has filled me with bitterness. He has made me to drink wormwood. So, understand, sweet but also bitter. Then I took it, the little book of the little scroll out of the hand of the angel and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. 
But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. This is what the scripture states. He ate it. That is, in the Greek, the word is katis dio, which means to devour or to eat down. John really enjoyed eating that scroll. So are we as Christians called to devour God's word and enjoy it. Uh, so afterwards, as John received a st sour, sour stomach, so do we. At times, we receive the same. Why is that? Because God's word at times does not agree with our flesh, but is all too sweet to the spirit. We're not called to please our flesh, but we're called to please our spirit. When God tells you, preach to a family member, or you might be happy God is about to use you. But when you do, it becomes sour because the message of the gospel is strong. Telling someone to repent and come to Jesus. This is not a message that's going to be received by all. So it's be it bitter. Including the one who tells it because they will receive persecution by it. Because you will be persecuted if you preach to your family. Or if you preach to your friends, you might get persecuted by them. They might mock you. They might say, are you crazy? I'm not going to become a Christian. I'm not going to be one of you. So... I'm just telling you that God's word is sweet, but it's also bitter. It's both. It's sweet and it's bitter. Now, we're going to verse 11. Verse 11, it's a verse that it's been making me think for the past couple weeks um, how to explain it. There's many people have their opinions on it, but really... I don't think none of them fit perfectly, and I'm not one that I think my opinion fits perfectly. Um, but let me read the verse, uh, verse 11. And he said to me, You must prophesy again about many people, nations, tongues, and kings. Very, this is a very hard verse for many commentators to comment on. For example, Adam Clark states the following. I must once more say that I do not understand these prophecies. Therefore, I do not take upon me to explain them. I see with great regret how many learned men have mi mistaken their, their way here. Commentators and even some of the most modern have strangely tripled in these solemn things. All trumpets, vows, and bowls are perfectly easy to them, yet from their description none get wise either to common sense or to the things that make for their peace. Like Adam Clark, I am not going to state I understand completely this verse. Some has taken it to mean that John was to minister again after leaving Patmos to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Others have taken it to mean that John, through the book of Revelation, will, will be prophesying to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings, while very few have even said that John will be one of the two witnesses spoken in Revelation 11. While it is true that John did make it out of Patmos alive and moved to Ephesus, whether immediately or years later, I do not know, but I do know that he was buried there, but... What what did he did after Patmos remains to me a mystery. Did he went out and prophesied to many nations, kings, um, people from different tribes and so forth? I don't know. I know he, he, he pastored in Ephesus. He was one of the seniors, one of the elders in Ephesus. But I really don't know that much about what he did. I could tell you a little bit about how he died. You can find in Fox's Book of Martyrs um, what his last words were and so forth. And they get their sources from probably Eusebius or someone like that. But I really, in this verse, I will leave it for you to decide what do you think it means. You're entitled to your own opinion. Where the scripture is not clear on, I guess. Um, as long as it's not in fact the major doctrine of the Bible, like the Trinity or heaven or hell, or salvation by grace, uh, I think in there you're entitled to your own opinion. But 
we'll find now in the time to come when Jesus Christ comes, I guess, or in the tribulation if um, from heaven or from here on earth, or we're, we're on earth at that time, we'll find out who are the two witnesses, if it's Enoch and Elijah, Moses and Elijah, or John and Elijah. It might be weird, but who knows? Who knows what God might do? God bless you. My name is Pastor Harris Kikalides, and you're watching here in the program, Getting to Know Jesus. And next study, we'll be studying Revelation chapter 11.